Hello and welcome to my podcast. If you do me a favor, subscribe to the John Com Report wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're watching on YouTube, like button, subscribe button, and you can check us out at Empire Media, A-M-P-I-R-E. It would be much appreciated. Well, today it's Tuesday, August 23rd, and here is your practice report. There's some news to report today, so let's get to a few of these, these items, starting with the retirement of Sonny Jurgensen's number nine jersey. Today happens to be his 88th birthday, so they made the announcement today. They're going to retire it at the Dallas Cowboys game, the season finale in week 18 at FedEx Field. Long overdue, folks, long overdue. Sonny, of course, was a great ambassador for the franchise, was a broadcaster, was an analyst for almost 40 years, a, a Hall of Fame quarterback for the team, made this team interesting in the 60s, and just a beloved person. And, you know, for the new gen- for this younger generation, it's, it's too bad that you didn't get a chance to experience him even more because he was a he had he was a great ambassador and remains that way. A couple of things that stand out to me. I got to know Sonny, and that's one of the pleasures of this job is getting to know him. One of my favorite memories on this beat was in my, I believe it was my first year on the beat. So we're down in Tampa Bay and um, we're getting picking up a crew. Back in the day, you had to go down to the public relations room at the hotel, pick up your credentials for the next day. So I went down there with a couple other reporters. We're sitting there talking to some of the PR guys and in comes Billy Kilmer, Sonny Jurgensen, and then a guy who was the equipment trainer back in the day. And they just started telling stories. And there's nothing that I can really repeat, unfortunately. What I remember is the look on Sonny's face compared to the look on Billy Kilmer's face when the equipment manager, I think it was Billy Devaney, I think his name was, um, when he was telling some of these stories about their time together with George Allen, et cetera. And Billy Kilmer was reveling in some of these stories. Sonny looked like a little bit, I don't want to say embarrassed, but just like not as have not having as much fun as Billy Kimmer was. And I think some of that was he had certainly matured beyond where his reputation was as a player. And one of the reasons why he never wanted to write a book because he didn't want to expose so many things in his life and he didn't want to write something that wasn't completely honest. So, but I do remember that night was a special night. And I remember after they left, just kind of saying, are we supposed to clap when they leave? Because it was, it was a fantastic show. And, but again, a lot of that was just sunny. And it was just fun to talk to him on the sidelines during a practice, walking by when you'd be at, and Rick Snyder know, we got to know him well, all these stories, you'd be at Frostburg, walking by this under this garage where you could park and watch some of the practice. He'd be parked, he'd be sitting in the car so he wouldn't be bothered during practice. And you could just sit there and talk to him for a while and you get this great insight. For example, like he was in on Gus Farratt long before this team started playing him ahead of Heath Schuler back in 1994. And that was his guy. And he kept saying they should be playing him. They should be playing him. Then it was Trent Green. He was saying for a couple of years that he thought Trent Green was the best quarterback on the roster. And he eventually turned out to be very right. And so just fun to get to know him. And, you know, I also remember from back in the day when, when he played for Vince Lombardi back in, in the one year Lombardi was here and how, Lombard, people would say that if Lombardi had, had 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 him in Green Bay as a quarterback, they may have gone undefeated a few times. <clears throat> they worked together that well. The other thing is he loved Lombardi and he would always joke like, you know, hey, he treated us all like dogs and he loved that. One guy who didn't was Sonny Center, Len Haas. He's like, wait a minute, I've been busting my ass for years. I don't need this guy to come in and push me. I already pushed myself. So it didn't sit well with everybody, but it did sit well with Sonny. And I think he loved playing from that was the best year, I think, in probably in his career as far as just his memories and just how well he understood the offense and how in, how in sync he was with the head coach in that regard. So the other thing now, after they retire this, that's, that'll be four numbers retired by the franchise. There certainly should be more, starting with, to me, Daryl Green. Then do you get to other Hall of Famers, John Riggins, Art Monk, those kind of guys, Charlie Taylor. Do you get to those guys and when? Because I think it's kind of hard to separate. If you're in the Hall of Fame, should you should you should you have your number retired automatically, or should you certainly be on that list? And then, do you extend it beyond it? Russ Grimm would be on there too. Do you extend it beyond anybody on that list? I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. If you're on YouTube, you can go post your comments underneath about players that you feel should have their numbers retired. And um, for me, I would start with guys who are in the Hall of Fame because otherwise, it starts to get really, really crowded. Do you do a Joe Theismann? Do you do certain other guys? If you do them, then you do Brian Mitchell. Then you do Joe Jacoby. Now you're suddenly looking at 
10 to 15 guys who deserve to have their numbers retired. And that's an awful lot for one franchise. But certainly Sonny Jurgensen deserves it. Great ambassador. And I think, again, to me, the next one should be Daryl Green. Other news, the Redskins placed, shoot, excuse me, the, this is what happened. You start talking about guys in the past. The commanders placed uh, Chase Young on the reserve PUP list with, to open the season, which means he's going to miss the first four games. He is not allowed to practice during this time, but he can come back in the, after four games and start to practice. And he can, uh, he can play in that fifth game if they feel he's ready. It's hard to imagine that we do that after missing so much time, but that's when he can start to come back and practice. Uh, and But he in the past with the pup, you had to be on the – you couldn't come back and return that first week you were back. You can now, but he's got to show that he's ready. I don't think you want to rush him back, and they've certainly been taking their time with him. But he was placed on there. Tyler Larson was placed on there. They also cut receiver Kelvin Harmon among their five moves today to get down to the 80-man roster limit. They placed Nate Geary on reserved injured list, and they cut tackle Rashad Hill. So but with Harmon, not surprised there. I know they liked him. I think they'd love to have found a place for him. He just doesn't have the speed, and other guys are better. He wasn't going to make it. Um, Dax Milne will be their sixth receiver. Question is, do they keep seven? And if they keep seven, it's Alex Erickson as a punt returner. So, but that's why Harmon was gone. But the big thing, again, was with Chase Young, and it means he'll miss at least four games. Not a surprise. The, what I had heard before camp was the earliest they thought he'd be back was mid-September. That was the optimist again. And then clearly it was now trending that way. And this at least gets this out of the way and he can continue rehabbing and getting better. All right, now let's get on to some practice notes. Percy Butler continues to, I think, take, make some progress. And Ron Rivera said one of the big reasons is confidence level. Now, I've noticed him working more with the starters in that third safety role. Derek Forrest, Forrest had been doing that, of course. But this past week, Butler seems to be getting more and more time there. What that means, don't know yet. But I think they're trying to see where is his comfort level because they obviously like him. They like Forrest, too. And I think they have two nice players to at least choose from there, two nice young players to choose from. But with, with Butler... One of the things that Rivera said is that in the first preseason game, they felt like the game was that he, he wasn't ready for the speed of the game. Second game, they felt he was. And I think the key there, he said what happened, what started to happen is he started to understand leverage better and how to play that leverage while facing that kind of a speed. Because if you can't play the leverage, if you lose your leverage, you're going to lose the advantage. And they felt he was better in that regard. So watch for Saturday to see how he handles some of that to see if he's ready to actually be that third safety. They also had Andrew Norwell back on the field in pads, and he was working at guard in that with that starting unit, um, with with Wes Schweitzer back at left, at, excuse me, at right guard and Norwell at left guard, and so looked looked fine. It's hard to tell. They would they would kind of rotate every, they would they would the starting unit, the starting line would go two reps, and then a backup group would come in with Wentz at quarterback. So it's hard to tell exactly where Norwell's at. It looked okay when I watched him, but I think it's just more something that we have to pay attention to. The fact that he was back was a good sign for them. The other guy I want to talk about who I think has started to make some, make some noise is uh, second-year defensive end, Shaka Tony. <clears throat> he's, and when you look at that defensive line group, he's going to be one of the last guys, if he makes the roster, he'll be one of the last guys in that line, uh, defensive line group. If you go back and watch the game against the Chiefs, he made a he made a pass rush the other day that was terrific. Just bends the out corner in a way that nobody else here is really doing, and it's those kind of plays that say maybe they should stick with him a little bit longer to see where he takes that. And the other play that stood out to them, and I don't know if I talked about this to you or not, but in in the Kansas City game, or excuse me, the first game, the Carolina game. Had a nice job, did a nice job on one punt return where he comes down, makes a nice tackle, um, and just something you want to see from a backup defense, a backup like that who is has some who can run and has some size. And he's not a huge guy, um, but he's for a situational pass rusher who's about normal size, but it gives him the ability to have another big guy who can run and cover. And I think they were very pleased to see him do that. Then they felt like he had a good week of practice, and then he went out and had that pass rush the other night. Keep in mind, when you look at this third preseason game, Shaka Tony is a guy who made this 53-man roster 
in part because of one rush. And there was goes into more than just one play, but what sealed it for them was one pass rush against the Baltimore in the preseason finale, where they said nobody else on this roster could make that move. So they wanted to see where can he take it. And I think they're still waiting to see more of that progress. But if you see moves like that, sometimes you just say, you got to hold on this guy as long as you can, as long as possible to see, does he start to develop from there? Anyway, so there, there you go. One of the other things I want to talk about is the coverage with William Jackson. I think, again, lots been made of that this week. In some cases, maybe a little bit too much because the problem, the problem in that game the other night was as much a pass rush. And one of the things I like, first of all, I love talking to Logan Paulson. He's my guy. And I learned a lot talking to him. Well, he on his the podcast he, that he and Craig Hoffman do, they had on London Fletcher, and they were talking about some of what happened the other night. Their focus, which I completely agree with, was on the pass rush and the inability to really apply any pressure and then getting out of your lane at times and creating other problems for the secondary and then forcing them to have to cover way too long. And then I think the other thing that London talked about was, and this is something I've always heard about, like, needing the coverage to match the, the, the pressure, right? So buying that, that defensive line a split second extra to get home. And they weren't really close enough the other night, to be honest. But getting them a little bit extra time to get home, and that's where it comes into varying coverages. When they were playing well last year, one of the things they were doing really well was disguising coverages. They beat the Buccaneers in part because go back and watch the game. They made Brady hold the ball and get off his first read because of the way they disguise coverages. That's something that they weren't trying to do, really, the other night. So that's something like, how do they develop there? Because I think that's going to be a key part of what they're going to show. But it goes back to getting that coverage to match the pressure, allowing you to then get home. And then, as London brought up, when, hey, listen, when you're third and short, you're not going to play zone because, or you shouldn't play zone and play off because it's an easy conversion. If it's third and long, you're not going to be playing man because then it's, to be honest, it becomes an easier conversion too. be a guy off the line and you got it. So, you know, that's just something to, to watch as they go forward. I don't think what they showed the other night is what they're going to show in terms of coverage looks, but it's got to be better. We all know that, but I do think they're going to, tr- I mean, I do think they have to disguise a lot more during the season. And that's where, like I said, when they were playing well, that's what they did. Well, today in practice, so I was watching some of, of William Jackson and there was, he had a couple plays today that to me stood out. One of which was there was a deep post to Dax Milne, excuse me, um, to Deami Brown. I'm sorry. Um, to Deami Brown. He, there was another pass broken up to Dax Milne uh, later in the practice, but this one was to Deami Brown or the look was there. That's what they wanted to go to. But the rotation for Jackson took him back to the deep middle because there was nobody in his side. So his job is rotate to the deep middle. And he did. And because of that, he takes away the deep ball opportunity. They had to go away from it. I think the quarterback, I think it was Wentz, um, basically has to pull the ball down. Um, certainly doesn't go to the guy he wanted to go to, but it was all because of Jackson's rotation. And it was, that's what they're supposed to do, but it was a good rotation nonetheless. He also had another play where this time he was off. He was off coverage and all the off coverage, the off coverage police, here you go. But and this one, it was on the same side as uh, Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson. So he's off in the other corner, of this inside corner. I think it was, I can't remember if it was Danny Johnson because Benjamin St. Juice wasn't out there. Um, but anyway, so they're playing off. But it, it allowed, it was like a third and nine. Um, and um, it allowed him to um, rotate. Up. And so, like, well, excuse me, allowed him to read the play right. That's what it certainly allowed him to do. So he, he just stays back reads a play and he dots and breaks outside. And then when he sees that Jackson comes up hard, makes a stop. It was a third and nine off coverage. It would have been a stop of probably one yard in that situation, but it was because of the read and the reaction to it. It gave him a chance to read the ball. The key is again, switching up the coverages. That's the key, not just playing one or the other, but switching up. If you're just playing one look, it's going to be easy to defend. We all know that. So, but I just wanted to point that out because sometimes it does work. But again, mix up the coverage because if you don't, you're going to be in trouble. Finally, a couple plays in the red zone. Uh, Carson Wentz to the back of the end zone to Jahan Dotson, a nice twisting catch back there. In fact, after the play, Chase Young was yelling out, we need more of that one. We need more of that. 
And then maybe one of the best throw, the, probably the best throw of the day came on a throw to Terry McLaurin in the corner of the end zone from Carson Wentz, a perfectly placed ball. Bobby McCain had pretty good coverage, but McLaurin makes a catch in the corner of the end zone as he runs out of bounds and he falls and slides onto the, to the, um, to be honest, onto the rocky half that's between, uh, between the field and the um, rest of the, the sidelines. So, but a really, really, really nice throw by Carson Wentz. So there you go. That's the practice report for Wednesday, excuse me, Tuesday, August 23rd. I will be back with another one on Wednesday. I'll talk to you next time.